Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our series on health literacy and chronic disease. My name is Katherine Mayberry, and I'm a research assistant in the Horowitz Center for Health Literacy. So, before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. Um, after the webinar, you can request the slides by going to this link. As an attendee, you're automatically muted. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box, and my colleague Anna is monitoring the Q&A box, and I'll pause at different points throughout the presentation to take questions. And if you're having trouble with audio, you can call into the webinar at this number. So thank you for being a part of the webinar. It's part of, it's one of six webinars created by the Horowitz Center for Health Literacy at the University of Maryland School of Public Health in partnership with the Maryland Department of Health. And the purpose of the webinars is to provide health literacy, technical assistance to Maryland health departments and local health improvement coalitions in their work helping residents prevent and manage chronic disease. The audience for these webinars are Maryland health professionals, students and staff in county health departments and local health improvement coalitions. And if you'd like to take our other trainings, you can go to this link here. So today's webinar, Speaking So Your Audience Understands, focuses on best practices and skills vital for oral communications about chronic diseases. In your work, you will create health messages, campaigns, and programs for people who have varying levels of literacy and health literacy, and who are at different places along the chronic disease management continuum. Some people may have recently been diagnosed with diabetes or heart disease, or they may be trying to manage diabetes that was diagnosed some time ago. Importantly, managing a chronic disease is a complex task that requires people to learn and master many new skills. And as public health professionals, we need to make sure all of our oral communications fit with our target population's abilities and needs so they're well prepared for the chronic disease journey. So clear communication is important for several reasons. The public health accreditation standards have health literacy and clear communication as elements of standards three, seven, and eight. Maryland's Diabetes Action Plan includes goals for maintaining a healthy weight, knowing pre-diabetes statuses, and reducing diabetes mortality. And all of these goals require communication, education, and health literacy work to achieve them. Maryland's primary care program has quality improvement objectives that align with health literacy and clear communication. And as we think about the work that you do working with the public, we want to make sure that you create and deliver oral health communications so people understand your messages and take actions to live healthier lives. So chronic disease management is complex. We expect people with chronic diseases to be adherent but many times we don't help them find or give them information and tools they can use to be adherent. For example, if you teach classes on how to prepare nutritious meals that are low in salt, fat, and sugar, there's a lot involved in making nutritious meals. People have to understand what proteins, fats, and carbohydrates are. They have to know how much of each of these nutrients is in a food. They have to know how to read a nutrition label. They have to understand portion size, and then they have to understand how to combine foods to prepare a meal that supports glycemic control. The words we use to talk about chronic disease can be complex, and for many people, the words can be unfamiliar and hard to relate to. So we want to keep these complexities in mind as we make it easier for people with chronic disease to hear and understand the oral information we give them. Clear communication is a core component of health literacy. The Horowitz Center uses the National Action Plan to improve health literacy as a guide for our work. And the underlying theme and message in the National Action Plan is that health information should be accurate, accessible, and actionable. And we talked about those three items, in, especially in webinar one under plain language. So our view is that health literacy grows and thrives when it's supported by all of these sectors coming together to build a health literate community 
and society. So last week, Healthy People 2030 launched their new health objectives for the nation for the next 10 years, and they revised their health literacy definition, which was focused primarily on the individual, and they split it into two levels, personal health literacy and organizational health literacy. And the new definition emphasizes people's ability to use health information to make well-informed decisions, and it incorporates a public health perspective and acknowledges that organizations have a responsibility to address health literacy. So there are four objectives for today's webinar. At the end of the session, you should be able to explain the demands oral communication places on the listener, describe four language elements that make oral communication easy or hard to understand, list three vocabulary features that reduce oral communication demands on the listener, and describe three pra practices to increase listenability in face-to-face -face conversations. So this is the outline for how we'll go through the information today. First, we'll talk about reasons to use oral communications in your work. Next, we'll review when you use oral communications. We'll identify language elements that make oral communication easy or hard to understand. And we'll describe practices you can implement to make your oral communications easier to understand. And we'll close with next steps and resources for you to consider when you create your oral communications. So let's get started. We'll talk about reasons to use oral communications. So there's many reasons that we use face-to-face um, -face, um, or telehealth communications in our work. So if you know your audience has weak reading skills and they may have stronger speaking and listening skills, oral communication is a better way to provide information than handing them a written material, say a pamphlet. You can use nonverbal reinforcements such as facial gestures and body uh, gestures to put people at ease and to help build rapport and trust. So if you smile, or as we do today, smize, nod your head or tilt your head to one side when listening to convey your interest, um, the person feels that you're taking an interest in them. It may help them feel understood and which can reduce their anxiety. We often use face-to-face -face communication to demonstrate an action. When you demonstrate an action, it allows people to learn by observation and showing a person how to do a task helps them to remember and retain the information. Another important reason to use oral communication is when you want to confirm understanding. It's an important step in teaching and learning. And when you confirm understanding, you know if you communicated your message in a way the person understands. You know if they heard and understood what you intended them to hear. And finally, dialogue is often necessary to explain information and ask questions. For example, if you're reviewing paperwork to enroll a person in a chronic disease program, it's important to be able to ask questions and clarify, and it's important for that person to be able to do the same. So besides face-to-face -face communications, we can use recorded audio or video to verbally communicate. So we can provide follow-up education after diagnosis. So when a person is newly diagnosed with a chronic disease, a health condition such as diabetes, they're often overwhelmed with learning they have a health condition that won't go away. And they receive a lot of information and they're told they need to take many actions to manage their disease. It's simply hard to remember all this information and all the things they need to do. So a video can help them process the information at their own pace, and they can share it with family and friends to get their support. And a video may provide answers to questions that they didn't think to ask when they were diagnosed. We can use a video to teach self-care skills. So a video can provide clear instructions that can be viewed multiple times at the person's convenience. So they can pause the video or rewind it if there's something they didn't understand. So for example, you could use a video to teach people who have diabetes how to test their blood sugar and safely dispose of needles. And we can use the power of the human face and voice to engage our audience by telling stories. 
So we can tell our own stories or we can use video testimonials created by others to tell stories of people who have the same health condition or health problem as our audience. And people often relate to the storyteller and become more engaged in the health task or health behavior. For example, we often see commercials with celebrities who've been diagnosed with diabetes and they tell us to get checked for diabetes. So if a person relates to a celebrity, they may become more engaged and go get tested. And finally, we can use videos to break down complex actions into smaller steps. And when we do this, it helps people remember and retain the information. We can also break down, um, we can also use videos to record um, a one-time task. So let's say I want to teach somebody how to properly brush their teeth. We can tell them how to do that, or a better way might be a one or one and a half minute video that demonstrates proper toothbrushing so that they remember it. So I um, have talked about reasons to use oral communications. And before I go on to when to use oral communications, I'd like to ask Anna if there's any questions. No questions yet. Folks, you're okay. welcome to answer, answer, uh, enter your questions in the Q&A uh, box. Go ahead. Okay. okay, great. So next we're gonna talk about when to use oral communications in your work. And there's lots of ways. Oral communication is essential to much of the work that health departments and local health improvement coalitions do. It's the method that we use when we create public service announcements, podcasts, and videos. For example, recently health departments have been creating public service announcement about COVID-19 for people with a chronic disease such as diabetes to tell them of their increased risk for COVID-19 and the steps that they should take to protect themselves. It's also the foundation for health promotion campaigns and chronic disease prevention programs. Oral communication is vital when we um, do uh, community health assessments to help prioritize community needs. It's important in um, many types of community meetings, say perhaps to get information from residents about many topics. We also use it when um, we create part working with partners. So local health improvement coalitions have many, many partners and oral communication is a huge part of how we engage people and connect with people. And finally, for health departments, it's important to be able to communicate within our team, within our organization and our department, and then also between other health departments. So next I'm gonna talk about language elements that make oral communication easy or hard to understand. So we know that people struggle with reading written information because the materials um, contain words people aren't familiar with, or the materials aren't in a context that they understand or can relate to. The text is dense and it's often written at a college level. When we verbally communicate information, these same language elements can be problematic for people with low health literacy. If the words use multiple syllables or our communication contains jargon, or long sentences, we are creating barriers for our audience. So we need to remember that oral communication places demands on the listener. For example, let's say you create a public service announcement that airs on a local radio station, and the PSA is about a diabetes prevention class that you're trying to enroll people into. When the message airs, the listener must first hear the message amongst all the other messages um, in, around them that day. They need to decide if the message is relevant to them at the present time or in the near future. And they can either ignore the message because it doesn't apply, or they might pay attention because maybe their healthcare provider told them they need to better manage their diabetes. If the listener pays attention to the message, they must cognitively process the message, meaning they need to hear each of those words sequentially and process the words to make sense of them then they must remember what the message was and what they're supposed to do, like check a website or call a phone number. So if the message is long or the listener thinks the message is complicated, they may ignore it. On the other hand, if the message is succinct and they understand it, they may take action such as looking up the program on a website. So the point is oral communication places demands on the listener 
and we want to create chronic disease messages so people are likely to hear our message and respond to it. So there's four types of language elements or ways that we structure our communications that make communication hard or easy to understand. These are complex language, jargon, context, and dialogue. And I'll go through each of these four. So the first um, is complex language. And one type of complex language is long sentences. So listeners with low literacy have a hard time processing messages with long sentences versus short or medium length sentences. And a medium length sentence is about 15 to 20 words. So long sentences are harder to process because they require the listener to hold a lot of information in working memory. Also, when you use long sentences, they often have multiple thoughts per sentence, which makes it yet harder to process and retain in memory. Oops. So here's an example of a long complex sentence. So um, the original is living well is a chronic disease self-management program that helps adults 18 years of age and older who have long lasting health problems come up with ideas to help them take charge of their health and live active and enjoyable lives. So that's one sentence with 41 words. And we revise that as living well is a program for adults with an illness such as diabetes or heart disease. The program helps participants manage their health and live active, enjoyable lives. So we have two sentences and 29 words. So the point that we're showing you here is if you were to say that first sentence, it's long, it's complex, and it requires more mental effort to process. So another example of complex language are complex words or words with multiple syllables. And they require, they simply require more effort than shorter words. So some examples of complex words are hereditary and hemoglobin A1C, which is something that we often um, see, you know, and hear in, um, when we work with people who have diabetes. So as opposed to saying hemoglobin A1C test, we might say a test that shows your blood sugar level for the past three months. And here's some more examples of complex words like hypertension, obstruction, and thrombosis. So the bottom line is words with more syllables are less familiar and more difficult to understand, and people may simply not hear them when you mention them. So a third for, form of complex language is passive voice. And we've talked a lot about passive voice in the first two webinars. So passive voice, with passive voice, it's hard to understand who's performing or should perform an action. So what we wanna do is avoid passive voice and use active voice, which is specific and direct. So um, here's a couple examples of passive voice. So in the first one, five healthy snack options were described. What we don't know is who was describing them to whom. When we rewrite the sentence that we would speak, we'd say the teacher described five healthy snack options to the class. So we know who is performing the action and who is receiving the action. And again, the bottom line is we wanna avoid the um, passive voice because active voice is easier for people to understand. So a final type of complex language is complex sentence structure. And complex sentences use linking clauses such as and, but, although, in order to. So here's an example of a complex sentence. Because she does not have reliable childcare, Mrs. Jones does not think she can regularly participate in our diabetes prevention program. So we simplified that by writing it in two sentences and we say, Mrs. Jones may not attend all the classes in our diabetes prevention program. She does not have reliable childcare. So we took something that was confusing with the introductory clause and we um, try to avoid these complex sentences because they make sentences longer and they're more difficult to understand. And they often have more than one thought per sentence, which places more load on our listener. So we talked a uh, second language element is jargon. And we did talk about that a lot in the first two webinars. So what I will say, it's a widespread problem and it interferes with comprehension. 
And jargon is specific to a profession or group. It has little meaning to those outside the profession. Um, and the problem is, is if you use jargon, the terms aren't familiar, so listeners may not hear your message. So here's an example of jargon, saying your sodium's too high. So if somebody's newly diagnosed with high blood pressure, they may not understand what that means. But if we were to write that in plain language, we would say your blood has too much salt in it. Salt is some, sometimes called sodium. Your blood needs some salt, but too much salt can cause problems like heart disease or stroke. We need to reduce the amount of salt in your blood. So more people can understand plain language than jargon. So plain language increases the number you of people that you reach, and that's really what we're trying to do with our chronic disease prevention programs and messages. So the fourth language element is something we call context. And contextualized language presents information in a personalized way. It uses concrete examples that are relevant to the listener. On the contrary, decontextualized language presents information in general terms, and it uses abstract ideas and words. So here's an example of a non-contextual sentence. Um, a family history of diabetes increases risk for diabetes by 26%. Your mom has diabetes. Having a family member who has diabetes increases the chances you may develop diabetes. So if you're talking to somebody, you want to put the, um, your message into context for the person so that they can relate to it and understand it. And people with low health literacy have a hard time comprehending and recalling decontextualized language. So we want to put it in context as much as possible. So the fourth language element is dialogue. And it, we characterize it in three ways. So the first is speech speed, which is how fast or slow a person talks. And people comprehend less if you talk too fast or too slow. So the thought is you want to pay attention to your listeners and see their reaction to how you're speaking and then adjust your speech in accordance. So another way we characterize dialogue is term density. And that simply means how long a person talks before stopping. So the longer you speak, the greater the amount of information that you're um, giving to the listener, it's more that they have to process. So we want to um, break our speech into smaller sections, take pauses, and ask for input so that we can reduce the barrier. So uh, study, it's also interesting that studies from medicine show that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of information given and the amount of information a patient can recall. So we want to decrease the density or the amount of information that we speak in a single turn. And then interactivity is how often people take turns when speaking. And the more that you interact, the more you take breaks, the more conversational your language. And when you speak in a conversational tone, you're taking pauses which allow the listener to process and comprehend what you're saying. So we've just talked about four different language elements that can make it easier or harder to understand your communication messages. So I'd like to pause here and ask Anna if there's any questions thus far. There are no questions so far. Okay. So next, I'd like to talk about practices that you can implement to make oral communication easier or harder to understand. So the first set of practices are called signaling. So this is how we give cues to our listeners as to what's coming up. So the first is we can give a cue by saying something like, I'm beginning this discussion of healthy eating by talking about what carbohydrates are. We can also signal by announcing our topics. We can say our next topic is exercise. Or we can signal transitions between topics. So we can say, we just talked about how to prepare meals that are low in salt. Next, I'd like to talk about how to pick snacks that are low in salt. So the transition there lets people know that you're finishing up one topic and you're moving on to the next. 
So another way, another practice is to summarize the information. So we can use internal summaries. We can say something like, we talked about two ways to make meal planning easier. First, we talked about having a glycemic index chart handy when you plan your meal. And second, we talked about counting carbohydrates. Next, I will talk about apps you can use to help you count carbs and plan and track your meals. So the point of using an internal summary is it reminds listeners of what they heard and then it signals what's coming up ahead. And then another way to summarize is to state and paraphrase important points. So if you had um, conducted a class on um, adding more vegetables, eating healthier into your diet, we could say at the end of that lesson, there's many ways to add more vegetables in your diet. As we mentioned, you can add leafy greens to your soups and replace pasta with squash. So we're stating and paraphrasing the important points of our message. So another way, um, another practice is to engage um, users using questions. So we can use questions to focus attention. For example, uh, following on from the last example, you could ask program participants, how would you get more leafy greens in your diet? And then we can use stories to convey information. Um, stories help listeners relate to and remember the information that we're uh, telling them. So we could say something like, one of our program participants from the last session talked about how she loved to make a casserole with ground beef, pasta, and cheese. As part of this class, we encouraged her to use spaghetti squash for the pasta, ground turkey instead of ground beef, and low-fat cheese. She tried it and um, she tried it and loved it, as did her family. So you can convey the same information in a story as you would if you were just giving guidance, but the story helps people remember and relate to it. So I'd like to go over a few practices for delivering chronic disease programs. Um, I'm sure that you're familiar with many of these, but we thought that we would just run through them from a communications perspective. So if you're teaching a new skill, it's really important that you demonstrate the skill. So it's good to explain the skill, demonstrate it, and then ask uh, participants or listeners to then perform and demonstrate the skill for you. We also want to assess and confirm participant understanding and engagement throughout our session. So we often use and talk about a, a technique called teachback. And TeachBack was first designed for healthcare providers to ensure that they explain medical information clearly so their patients understood. Um, with TeachBack, you tell participants you want to make sure you explained a topic clearly and ask them to explain the topic. So you could use TeachBack, say for example, you're teaching people how to read a nutrition facts label and you had just gone through that. And then you could say something like, I just went through a lot of information I want to make sure that I explained how to read and use the nutrition facts label so you can use it later. Would you partner up with, you know, it could be the person sitting next to you, socially distant, or it could be somebody else in a session. And then please explain to that person what you'll do when you read a nutrition facts label at home. The other thing that we want to do is encourage questions and solicit feedback throughout um, any sort of presentation that we give. So, and if no one asks questions, you could say something like, when I typically present on this topic, say on tracking my blood sugar, people often ask me, what's the best time to check my blood sugar levels? And then you could ask a participant when she would check her uh, blood sugar levels. So we want to um, make sure that we encourage questions and solicit feedback throughout. It's another way to engage people. And then last, we want to review material before moving on to a new topic. So um, especially if a program is multiple sessions, you wanna begin each session with a review. And it's a good way to be able to understand what was clear in the last session and what might need clarification. And then remember, repetition helps your listeners remember the information that you're giving them. And then finally, we want um, to reinforce oral communications with written information, but we need to review the materials to make sure that your organization gives clients or patients materials that have been reviewed for low literacy audiences. 
And you can also use graphics, um, use models, you can use pamphlets and write on them or highlight or hand draw. So it's really good to present information in multiple ways because it helps reinforce the messages and the information the person's learning. So next I'd like to talk about nonverbal communication. So it's an important part of oral communication. So how you look and you listen and you move and you react tells your listener or your audience you're interested in them, if you're being truthful and how well you're actually listening to them. So it can strengthen or complement or even contradict your oral message. So when our uh, nonverbal cues match up to our words, it helps build trust and clarity and rapport. So some of the ways that we use nonverbal communication is eye contact. So it's important to make eye contact, but not to stare. And we really need to be aware of cultural differences in comfort with eye contact. And facial expressions are a great way to um, show our emotions. Am I happy to be here today? Am I interested to be here today? Um, our body posture and movement um, is another way that we communicate and signal our confidence and self-esteem. And we talked before early in the um, webinar that gestures such as head nods are an important way to signal your interest and that you're listening. Our voice is another important um, part of our communication. It is, it's not nonverbal, but it's really important. And we need to think about things like the tone and the pitch and the rhythm, the loudness or the inflection. And then proximity. Cultural norms and COVID-19 dictate a certain amount of distance, and we just simply want to be aware of them so that we don't violate those. And finally, besides thinking about your own nonverbal communication, you want to pay attention to the body language and the nonverbal communication of your audience because it can signal if they have questions, whether they agree with you or disagree, or if they want to ask a question. So we've all been spending a lot of time in uh, the virtual world. So we thought we'd go back over some practices for telehealth or teleprogram sessions. So the first is before you actually engage in that telehealth visit or that teleprogram session, we want to provide information about what the visit will entail, what the protocol is, what technology is required, and what will happen if the session is disconnected, because we've all experienced that, like what do we do next? And then what happens after the visit? And you um, want to provide guidance ahead of time so the person has this information together before the visit. If consent is required, you want to let them know that ahead of time. And then it's really helpful if you provide this information on your website or patient portal. It helps minimize problems and questions and troubleshooting. Another important part of telehealth is to consider your website manner. And by that, we mean it's your environment, your attire, the privacy, and the nonverbal communication. These are all important to the person on the other side of the screen. And then um, when you have a telehealth session, you want to establish rapport quickly and communicate empathy. And finally, just with, as in in-person visits, we want to remember communication best practices, such as using plain language, focusing on the two to three most important parts, um, points that we're trying to get across, and using teach back to assess and confirm understanding. So overall, um, for oral communication practices, we want to limit the amount of information that we provide, put the most important information first, and limit the information to two to three main points, and then repeat the information so it helps your listener remember the information. We want to address language differences. So for example, we want to know um, for different audiences that English is a second language or a non-English speaking populations, how will we communicate with this, um, or how will we commute with these people? Um, will our examples that we're giving be culturally appropriate? And then finally, we want to practice, practice, practice. It's just like anything in life with oral communication. 
You want to practice um, how you'll speak, how you'll deliver, and um, think about the messages that you're providing. So I'd like to pause here and see if there's any questions before we uh, wrap up with next steps and resources. Yes, Catherine, uh, there's a question about ideal lengths for oral presentations um, and whether there's any research on length of presentation versus how much information someone retains. Well, um, I, you know, I haven't been to the literature, but what I can talk about is at the university, you know, we're getting ready. Um, we had an abrupt interruption in March and classes moved online quickly. And this fall, um, most of the courses here at the University of Maryland uh, will be virtual. And so we've been given guidance and um, that about 10 minutes, 10 minute chunks that if you've got a lecture that's 45 or 50 minutes, we've been advised to break that up into five, seven, no more than 10 minute sections um, so that people can digest it. And we have to think about um, especially if we're thinking about the world that we're in right now in this virtual world, that people have lots of things that are competing for their time and their interest. And so, you know, small sections is, is a big piece of it. So that's kind of, I was going to say, that's kind of how I've outlined my class for this fall. I might have a 45 minute lecture, but I'm breaking it up into um, different uh, seven to 10 minute uh, chunks, and then I'm having people do activities and then come back in um, to, um, to listen and uh, participate. Any other questions, Anna? Uh, no, that's it. The, the asker of that question said thank you. Okay, great. So um, now I'd like to talk about go into some next steps and some resources. So after today's session, some of the things that you could do, you could think about an oral communication you've created or a program that you have in which you deliver content. And you could ask yourself, how well does your communication follow the techniques that we talked about today? You could also choose an oral communication and revise it using some of the techniques, um, being aware of you know, sentence length or jargon, um, simplifying information, using um, the active voice. And then finally, you could use what you learned today to begin a conversation among your team about how you can communicate your message uh, to your audience so that they understand it. We want to um, be aware of the demands that oral communications put on um, our listeners. Often I think you know, we're aware that written materials can place this burden, but we don't necessarily think about that when we think about our oral communications. So we want to think about um, as we create any new sort of message, um, is it written for um, a low literacy audience so that everyone can understand it? So to help you um, in your um, work with oral communications, there's two plain language glossaries, and they're both great. One is CDC's Everyday Words for Public Health Communication, and the other is United Health Group has um, a glossary called Just Plain Clear, and it has uh, thousands of medical and technical terms that um, have alternative words or plain language words. It's really very helpful as we craft our communications. And then some resources for you to consider as you create oral communications. Um, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has online training courses in health literacy and plain language for public health professionals, and they're free. The Center for Plain Language website has language, information, templates, and tools that you can use um, as you try to craft messages using plain language. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Improvement has um, a tool called Universal Precautions Toolkit. And this is the second version. And it explains how to simplify communications and confirm comprehension with all patients to minimize risk for miscommunication. And while it was designed for clinicians and providers, the guidance can be used for our public health work and health promotion and disease prevention. And then lastly, we provided a link to an article 
on listenability as a tool if you want to understand more about listenability and the burden that our oral communications can place on our listeners. So that's it for today's webinar. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that we have three more webinars in our series. Next week, we'll be talking about designing chronic disease programs that address health literacy. On September 9th, we'll talk about tips to create more engagement with diabetes programs. And on September 16th, we'll close our series with what diabetes educators know about periodontal disease and diabetes. And you can sign up for these by going to the link here. And then um, we'd appreciate it if you would complete the post webinar evaluation. You can join our email list at goumd.edu, the Center for Health Literacy um, email sign up. You can request these slides, they'll be available. And then you can email us at healthliteracy at umd.edu. So are there any other questions before we conclude today's session? No questions, Catherine. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to having you at our next uh, series of webinars.